Hi. Well, so hopefully you'll um, be able to follow this through. There's copies of the presentation coming along. You can have at the end of the session this morning. I thought it was going to be the, the title for the whole conference today, but I'm told I've only got 15 minutes, I'm afraid. Now, for me, the reason I love diabetes is because exactly that reason. It, it combines physical health care and the whole person, how the person engages. One of the things I really notice about diabetes care is that people often come to us in Rampton very mentally ill, and as their mental health improves, we see improvements in diabetes care. If someone's got poorly controlled diabetes, I suspect it also has quite a significant impact upon their mental health. Think if a person has a high blood glucose level, it will affect their mood, how they feel. So the impact of diabetes is more than just long-term conditions. It has a real day-to-day -day impact upon our patients. So in the next few minutes, we're going to look at a few statistics. You've had some of them revealed already this morning. A couple of, a couple of scenarios that have occurred for us and you may well come across, and just a few learning points. You've already heard something about our prevalence of diabetes. Nationally, 4.5% prevalence of diabetes, but we're at 17.6%. Broadmoor and Ashworth, something similar. Now, people often say to me, why is this? Is it just those antipsychotic medications that you use? We'll explore that a bit in a moment. Just to say that we've got five patients with type 1 diabetes, which definitely produces its own challenges. They're a really important group we need to come back to. To give you a little bit of an idea about Rampton, we've got about 340 patients. We could fairly say that we've got 50 patients in each of the groups. DSPD, Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder. Learning difficulties, mental health, personality disorder, and women's. And as you'll see, that mental health's got 130 patients, and the others are roughly similar sizes. But the distribution of diabetes is not even across the hospital. Strangely, interestingly, lung difficulties currently has the lowest percentage of diabetes, something under 10%. Personality disorder has over 25%, and that maybe defies some of our normal logic. So we're going to look at some of the factors now about why are people so much more at risk. We need to be aware of family history, first and foremost. It's been known for well over 100 years that diabetes runs in families of people with mental health problems. We know that people coming into our hospitals often have got disorganised, chaotic lives before they come to us, which clearly has an important bearing before they come. Why are people developing diabetes so much while they're in hospital with us? Well, when we look at the statistics, we see that 50% of people with schizophrenia have a family history of diabetes. That's the same equivalent of, of somebody who's got diabetes, who's just developed it. It also has a chance of 50% also in their family of having had diabetes beforehand. So there's clearly a close linkage. Julia showed some figures on age earlier on. I can just elaborate on that very slightly and show you that, as you'd expect, the younger people, 20 to 29, have a lower rate of diabetes. Even in that age group, it's around 5%, which, would, which is about the national average for all age groups. By the time we get up to the older group, the reason we're up here, we've only got three patients over 70, and they've all got diabetes. Now, what about obesity? We heard a little bit earlier about the importance of obesity. You've even seen some of our statistics for it. But when we look at how that pans out across the hospital, we can see that the red bars here are BMI greater than 30. Fairly even distribution of uh, BMI greater than 30, around the 50% mark. We've also, in the cream colors here, got BMI greater than 40. 
And we can see, again, it's not an even distribution across the hospital, and neither pattern fits exactly with our diabetes distribution. One might read something into the fact that as diabetes increases, the blue blocks, the very obese people also seem to increase there. But it's certainly not a close correlation there. And what about our antipsychotic medication? How is that distributed across the hospital? Well, perhaps no surprise, the Dangerous and Severe Personality Disorder Unit, 34% of people are taking antipsychotic medication. And I know that's a question that's been raised already this morning about the appropriateness of that and the impact that it will have. But in the Learning Difficulties Unit, we've got 70% of antipsychotics, and yet they've got the lowest rate of diabetes. So it's telling us it's not a simple relationship. As I say, so often people say to me, it just must be the medicines, that's why it happens in this environment. I hear not mental health, no surprises, 91% of people on antipsychotic medication. Women's, of course, is a mixed group, and we've got about 50 women with a range of different problems. <coughs> Let's put that together as a summary. Four to five times the rates of diabetes. The national prevalence of, so, uh, of exercise, for exercise, I've got another figure to add in here for you here, on exercise, we managed to dig up recently. We're starting recording people who get no exercise in our hospital. And our current figures for, uh, as far as we go, to, looking at total population, 50% at least would claim to get no exercise. And I really mean no exercise there. Walking from a ward to the, to the hospital shop is regarded as activity. You don't even have to walk and get your meals or anything else. So it's a very, very low rate of activity for many patients. I'm trying to get some sort of national figure, 20% of people would say they get less than 20 minutes walking in any week. So again, we're more than twice the national average for inactivity. Nationally, BMI greater than 30, 26%. BMI greater than 40, here are figures, 1.5% for men, 3.5% for women. Our total is 4.95% with a BMI greater than 40. A lot of big people with us. And of course, we add to that 72% of people on antipsychotics. So what are we to make of this? What are we to think is the cause of diabetes? Well, I want to say to you that they're all a cause of diabetes. And that this is a slide from Professor Richard Holt, who said the traditional risk factors remain our most important principal cause. Having schizophrenia, having mental illness, has been shown to have some additional burden. And then our medication, both typical and atypical antipsychotics, have a small but important effect, which we'll return to in a moment. Now, for me, the reason this is really important is to say, oh, it's same old risk factors. Actually, what that really means is that we've got to treat the whole person. We need the whole team working and interacting here really well. We can't just dismiss this and say, well, if only our psychiatrists wouldn't prescribe those drugs, there wouldn't be a problem. It's much more than that. It's a whole lifestyle approach for our patients. So what about atypical antipsychotics? What can we say about them? We know they cause significant weight gain, often very rapidly. I certainly can see people putting on three, four, five stone in, say, the first six months of being in the hospital at times. Quite a, a, a medical disaster for them, even though it may well be important for their mental health with the drugs they're taking. Antipsychotics from big studies, much bigger than our hospital, do show a small but significant effect on blood glucose. As a general rule, you'd say that the effect was quite mild for most people. But occasionally, and we've heard an example earlier this morning already, we see a very big significant effect. One little side note here. We mentioned smoking this morning and the effect on, on physical health. I can't explain why, but in, when we banned smoking in Rampton, in the months afterwards, five people developed diabetes, type 2 diabetes very rapidly. We're going to return to a couple of those people in just a moment. 
But we know that when you stop smoking, your, your levels of clozapine and other antipsychotics will increase. So maybe there's some important clues there. And all five patients who developed diabetes in that time were, uh, were on antipsychotics, either olanzapine or clozapine. Maybe there's a number of reasons why diabetes is difficult to treat in this group. Clearly, they're on these drugs because they've got huge problems elsewhere. They've got disorganized, difficult lives. That's the starting point. But it's certainly also true to say that our standard treatments for diabetes, from my observation, seem less effective in some of the people who are antipsychotics. Now, I want to start to come to some unusual things for us. Are we just bad clinicians? We've had three people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes who turn out not to have type 1 diabetes. Let me just talk you through them. Our first man was a young man in his early 20s, pretty obese, who had fairly recently come to our hospital. It was just when I first started there seven years ago. Over a weekend, he was noticed to have very high blood glucose levels, something in the 20s and went out to our local secondary care unit. Whereupon they told, said he had type 1 diabetes. He stayed a couple of days, they got him on insulin, and he came back to me. Now, unfortunately, due to his mental health problems, he wouldn't go back to secondary care for any further follow-up. And so I carried on managing him over a number of years. I gradually increased his insulin, and I noticed that I wasn't getting the sort of response I'd expect in type 1 diabetes. His diet stayed poor, I should say. With time, seeing his huge size, I introduced some of the typical drugs for type 2 diabetes, trying to reduce the potential for insulin resistance. And I was surprised to notice that they actually had more of an effect than the insulin was having. So this is a long history for this guy. Over a number of years, I gradually came to conclude that it was metformin, a glitazone, and more recently, exenatide as well, one of our new drugs there. That got his sugars down better than the insulin. Our advent of telemedicine allowed me to discuss this with diabetologists elsewhere, which was very helpful. And we together concluded that this man had type 2 diabetes induced by medication, not type 1 diabetes. And it had this label for six or seven years first. To finish that story, he had a gastric bypass not long ago. And, and he was told by the, the uh, clinicians at the hospital, it's OK, after your bypass, you'll come straight off insulin, it won't be a problem. So he came off insulin. He was determined to come off insulin at that point. And he's managed without insulin. And his weight's come down lovely. It's great. He's a thin man now. Not, not the man he was. But his HbA1c has gone up, not down. And he's still on clozapine. So I think there's something really quite complicated happening here. Uh, and we need to be ca careful in the assumptions we make. It's not traditional diabetes as we know it. A couple of minutes, Tom. A couple of people with, 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 with type 1 diabetes there, we won't go through them all, but just to say this happens fairly frequently. I want to take you to uh, three patients who have had bariatric surgery as well. We've mentioned this one, the first one there. Again, it, it's been very useful. It's certainly not a panacea. So what are our learning? Profound effect of antipsychotics for a few individual people. Can be difficult to control. Very, very quickly takes this case study. This is kind of a slightly generic case study because it's based on at least two people and others I've known elsewhere. A common scenario is when we have people who go into seclusion and won't take their medication, won't engage. They're at particularly high risk at that time. We have a discussion this afternoon that I think we'll touch on this subject. My learning points from this, which come with our final learning points in just a second, First of all, make sure you know who has type 1 diabetes. Because when those people go into seclusion, they really are at risk. Type 2 diabetes, they might miss their medication for a day or two. They will probably be OK. If they've got type 1 diabetes, type 1 diabetes and they're missing out, there's every chance you're going to have a crisis, potential uh, medical calamity on your hands. Quickly say, we've had, we haven't got time to talk about why 16 people have got diabetes resolved there, but it's clearly it's something about the diagnosis, why it happens. All of these people have been diagnosed with glucose tolerance tests. So there's a lot of abnormality happening in terms of glucose metabolism in this group. 
One last sort of learning points for you. Just think how much changes when you come into one of our, uh, our establishments. Your life has been difficult and chaotic before, and yes, we bring some order, but what a different order it is. That will change so much what is happening for you. Our environments are hugely important. We need a multifactorial approach. I've said diagnosis can be a problem, and with that, remember the advent of HbA1c. We can now use it as a screening tool. We can use it for diagnosis. That, I think, is particularly helpful for some of our patients who may be reluctant to go through the process of glucose tolerance testing. But just remember, the people you pick up and, and say have diabetes from HbA1c are a different group than you find from glucose tolerance testing. We can have a discussion all day about why and does that matter. But they will be slightly different groups, particularly those that are perhaps only just newly diagnosed. I come to my last big three points for you. If you work with anyone with type 1 diabetes, you have a clinical responsibility to know about it and to make sure that everybody else knows about it. We've been lucky with our type 1 diabetic who wouldn't take his medication. Uh, other places I know there have been deaths occurred because of this. And in particular, this can occur when someone goes into seclusion or segregation. They're clearly going into that environment because there's something very serious happening. But all the more reason at that time why we have to look after their diabetes care. And my last point, and in some ways I feel that almost the most important point I want to make, is this is about teams of people managing. Many of our environments, and many of you, may just come and do sessions sometimes <laughs> in, in, in a secure environment. And it's good that people do that but we still need to be part of a clinical team within that environment. One of the emphasis of primary care over recent years has been to establish teams in our primary care. We need the same teams in high secure. That means that people need to meet together, not just see a few patients and go again. You need to talk, you need to communicate. If you don't have regular primary care team meetings in your environment already, I would encourage you to do so. Thank you.